David, I'm, I'm, I'm here from South Wellfleet. I'll be here for a short while. I may not be here for the whole meeting. Great. Chuck Cole, thank you, Chuck, for coming. Appreciate your time. Will the, David, will the video Deidre, be available later? Deidre yes. mentioned in the chat that she does not have video or microphone on her computer. Who is that? Deidre. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Yep. yep. All right. So uh, again, my name is David Agger, and I'm one of the cemetery commissioners, and I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, for those of you that are new to this gathering, we, uh, the cemetery commissioners and staff of some private cemeteries from Brewster out to Provincetown met last January for the first time in our knowledge ever, uh, just to share who we were, what our charges were, and what our successes, challenges, and future planning plans were gonna be. And one of the big topics that people seem to be interested in, they're curious about, not committed to, but interested in was the, uh, the concept of green burials and sort of the whole continuum. And for those of you that are familiar with it, I think that Candace and Judith will give you a little bit more background on it. But I just wanted to mention that that's why we're here today. That's the topic of, of our meeting. And what I wanted to do in terms of business was to first of all, welcome you all and then share with you the ground rules for th this Zoom chat. And then I'm gonna give you a chance to introduce yourself in a one sentence introduction, who you are, why you're here. And then I will introduce uh, the, the staff and members of Green Burial, Massachusetts, which uh, I'm, I'm taking liberty here. They'll tell you who you, they are, but I believe they're a nonprofit organization that really is involved with furthering the idea of this continuum of green burials and what that means in general and also specifically to Cape Cod. They're gonna try and share with us. So again, ground rules. And again, I wanna say right up front, this is the first time that Nancy and I have been co-hosting a Zoom meeting. So be gentle with us because, <laughs> we're, and we're gonna to look to you for support in terms of making this happen. Uh, we're, because, all the cemetery commissioners are here. We're following open meeting guidelines. Uh, unless I'm incorrect, we I believe we are recording this meeting. Uh, Nancy, correct? I believe so, yes. Okay, great. Yep, it's being recorded. Perfect, thank you. Uh, we're requesting that everybody, like you're doing now pretty much, to please keep your microphone on mute and request to speak using the hands up icon. And again, uh, for, for many people, you'll, you'll look for a place on you, the screen where it says more, and then you'll get, get be given the option to raise your hand. And then uh, Nancy or I will call on you in, in, in a fashion, trying to keep track of, of who raised their hand first, but we'll do the best we can. I'm David. May yes. I just jump in here and say that we are ask everyone to be muted until the end of the presentation, and then we will have Q&A. So considering that we now have 20 people in the meeting, can we leave the one sentence intro until the end? Because I know Candace has to leave by 1130. That's fine with me. Okay, okay no, great. no questions during the presentation. Good, good. Uh, af after uh, Candace and, uh, her, and her group have allotted approximately an hour and a half to be with us and then at least Candace and maybe more people have to leave that time. So what we're proposing is that they're gonna do a presentation, individual and group presentation on a variety of topics. And then they'll leave at least 25 minutes to answer questions. And what we would like to request is that people who are actually cemetery commissioners or work for one of the private cemeteries on the Outer Cape, if you could, if everyone else could allow them to ask questions first, if they have them, and then we will uh, fit everyone else in. If for some reason you don't get your question asked and or answered, uh, the wealthy cemetery commissioners are gonna be here. We have the Zoom meeting until one o'clock. So if you don't get your questions answered, please stick around and we wanna give the cemetery commissioners and the general public an opportunity to chat more informally about this idea of green burials from 11.30 till one o'clock unless people have gotten everything they wanted from it. So uh, without further ado, uh, 
uh, I would like to welcome Candace Curry and Judith and whoever else is with them uh, to this Zoom chat. And thank you for your time and your expertise. So Candace, please take over. Okay, thank you, David. And I am curious of the people who I can see on the screen to now physically raise your hand if you're part of a cemetery commission on the Cape. Okay, so it looks like maybe half of you or, or you have some affiliation with a private cemetery perhaps? Okay, okay, great. Um, so this presentation is a little bit different from a typical Greenboro, Massachusetts presentation because I know many of you were also concerned about digging graves safely in sandy soil, as well as some folks had some concerns about chemotherapy uh, chemicals going into the ground. And originally when I had scheduled this with David, I had hoped I would be able to have a soil scientist here and maybe somebody from a health department. And I don't have those people, but I have spoken to some of those people so I can share the information that I have. So I, I would also like to say that I'm gonna be sharing my screen and showing you some images. When I do that, I can't see you. So perhaps David, if, if, if there's a question or somebody is confused by something or they just can't see something, I invite you to um, interrupt me and, and we'll resolve whatever question or issue is going on. Great. And I also just wanna give a shout out to Judith Lorai. Judith is our board chair of Greenboro, Massachusetts. And um, so thank you Judith for being here. And many of you know Sophia Saig, and she's um, on the commission in Brewster, and she's also part of Greenboro, Massachusetts. So I'm going to try to share my screen and show you a presentation. Okay, can people now see a picture of the Cape? Yes. Perfect. <clears throat> so the agenda looks like this. I'm, I'll talk a little bit about conventional versus green burials. And then I will be more than happy to invite Ed Bixby to talk a little bit about sandy soils in Woodbine, New Jersey for Steelman Town Cemetery. Um, we'll hear a little bit from Sophia about roosters, green burials and a little bit about safe water standards according to the World Health Organization and the Mass DEP. And also, I believe Barry may still be here. He might have something to, to say about uh, digging burials on the Cape. Okay. So a conventional cemetery versus a green cemetery that's in upstate New York. I'm guessing most of the cemeteries on the Cape might look similar to this one on the left under the conventional category. This looks like it might be Mother's Day or close to Memorial Day because of the number of flowers we see here. And it's got lawn. And at the back of this cemetery, we can see some piles of soil. So anything that came out of these graves is typically put back somewhere, usually where one can't see it. And that is the definition of a conventional cemetery right there. The stuff that's displaced by the vault and the casket is put off somewhere else to be used at some other future point in time. Whereas in a green burial, the mound that we see in the middle of this picture is actually a burial mound. So rather than moving all the soil that's been displaced by the casket, it's mounded up over the casket. And over the course of 12 months, 18 months, the soil will slowly sink down as the casket and the body decompose and it will become flat again. A conventional burial setup this particular contraption on the left, you may use these on the Cape. I'm not 100% I'm not positive, but what we're looking at here is a vault on a lowering device. 
this vault, it could be metal, but most likely this is concrete painted to look like metal. The casket would go into the vault, the cover would slide over, and then the whole thing would be lowered into the grave. And these are basically fake greens, but in cemetery parlance, those are referred to as the greens. Unlike this picture in the middle is from Steelman Town in New Jersey. Ropes are being used rather than the canvas straps to lower a casket into the ground. The pile of dirt is still present as are all these shovels because it's cathartic for the family to actually help in filling in the grave. And this image on the right from Gill, Massachusetts, we have part of the lowering device on wooden slats here to help keep a stable, firm area around the grave, just like Ed also does in Steelman Town. And the pile of dirt is right there and it will be going back in. So a natural burial ground can certainly still use the lowering device if that's what's wanted. And conventional burial grounds typically always use the lowering device. So the other thing about conventional burial, there's the preparation of the body and that happens in the funeral home. And that's done primarily with toxic chemical embalming. It's, it is a formaldehyde based solution. Embalming is not required by law, but it's usually done for cosmetic reasons. And often the funeral home will require that the policy for viewing a body needs to be embalmed. And typically the fluids that come out of the body for the embalming process are going into a septic system or some type of water treatment system. The preparation of the grain, including the outer container, is usually performed by the cemetery itself, although sometimes the outer container may be sold by the funeral home. And the container itself, it could be a wooden casket. It could also be a shroud. It could be a metal casket. And in the case of Mount Auburn Cemetery, this lower picture is showing an area of new graves that have been installed with concrete grave boxes. And these things weigh about 2000 pounds and it requires a, a backhoe or some piece of heavy equipment to actually install these things. So conventional burial really isn't any cleaner than green burial. And it could be argued that just the opposite is true. So regardless of what type of burial we're doing, the real question is, you know, what really do we want going into the ground? You know, do we want this particular casket going into the ground? So it's, it's um, green burial has a, an extra fight because people often believe that us human beings are full of diseases. And therefore, once we put a green burial body in the ground, we are potentially polluting the earth. And, you know, what we need to understand is in fact, we are more dangerous to each other alive than we are dead. And case in point is this Zoom call right now. We are separated from each other because of COVID-19. And um, so it, it's, burial is part of our tradition. It's, it's, it's the way many of us want to be buried want, and want to um, be recognized as something green. If we've lived our life in a green way, we want to be able to give something back to the earth. And so that's what green burial is ultimately about. And I recognize that on the Cape, you have sandy soils. And so at this point, I would like to invite Ed Bixby to say a few words. And I've, I've gone the extra mile and there's a, a video that's been created 
by somebody from the Atlas Obscura magazine, media. And the, the owner of uh, the uh, editor wanted to dig a grave and Ed offered up his cemetery. So Ed, I could uh, keep clicking if you wanted to speak to these slides somehow, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you. So, so let okay. me just say, Ed, let me also further introduce you. Ed owns is, and operates Steelman Town Cemetery in New Jersey. He also has two cemeteries in California, one in Portland, Oregon, and one in Pennsylvania. So he has a wealth of information with all kinds of soils, but specifically uh, Cape May, where he's calling from, I think are the most similar soils to what's going on on Cape Cod. So take it away, Ed. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I want to say hello to Green Burial, Massachusetts. Uh, they were kind enough to come visit Steelman Town a few years ago, so they have a firsthand experience of uh, the property and, and kind of what you're going to see in this video. So the one thing I'd like to say to the cemetery commissioners and, and the individuals working at private cemeteries is uh, I appreciate the fact you're open-minded and that you're here to, uh, to listen to what we have to say. Uh, the one thing I'd like to let you know is that not only should we be offering this to our communities, but uh, as far as your cemetery is concerned, you're going to find that this is going to be actually a very, a, a very fulfilling uh, experience for yourselves, but also for the bottom line of the cemeteries. And I say that not to make it about money, but as we know, we do need uh, finances to take care of these places that we call our forever uh, resting. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, sure, I'd love to, to tell you a little bit about the experience of digging a grave here in Cape May County, which I'm very familiar with Cape Cod and her area. And I do, uh, I do know that I think that we, uh, we probably are almost very similar, maybe even identical in many ways when it comes to the actual soils that you'll encounter when you're digging these graves. So go ahead, Candice, if you'd like to go ahead and play the video, I'd be glad to oh, speak. Oh, so, yeah, I wasn't going to actually play the video. What I, what I did was take some screenshots. Um, Good. And, and so at, at this point, um, Steelman Town is surrounded by 25,000 acres of the Belle Plain State Forest, which is such a luxury, Ed. I mean, it's just beautiful. And um, thank you, Candice. This is Chris Naka from Atlas Obscura. And Ed, maybe you want to describe the process that you went through to, to, to get Chris to this point. Sure, absolutely. So I, I understand that many of the cemeteries, I'm more than sure, are using heavy equipment to dig their graves at the moment. Uh, the way we do things at our natural burial preserves is, is by hand, and there's a couple different reasons for that. Uh, if you're in an, in an environmentally, environmentally sensitive area, that, that's very important because having heavy machinery can cause a little bit of damage. But also when excavating these grave sites, in particular in, in the sandy soil condition, uh, it really, you, you have to take particular care. Uh, heavy equipment can be a bit disruptive, believe it or not. I know it's very quick, but as you open these sites, you know, you're going to encounter obviously some very uh, sandy soils but the beauty of that is that they should be well compacted. Uh, obviously, if they've never been disrupted, you'll have very compacted soil. And if you dig them by hand or are open-minded to dig them by hand, I think you'll find that you really won't encounter some of the problems you believe you may encounter or you, you may be encountering now using the heavy equipment to dig in these sandy soils. So we stake this, this uh, individual area up for this gentleman and we allowed him to remove the top layer of soil. And in natural burial, it's important, in, in particular, depending if you're in a, a sensitive area, that uh, you remove the soils and replace them as they were removed. So you can certainly foster the plant life and things like that after the grave is filled. So uh, typically it takes about three and a half to four hours to excavate a grave site in sandy soil conditions. 
as you can see, if you look uh, at that gentleman kneeling in the gravesite right now, he's probably about two and a half feet down. You can already see the evidence about eight inches below the topsoil level of what looks like uh, beach sand. Essentially, that's silica sand. South Jersey, you know, um, during the ice age was under the ocean. Uh, so pretty much we're dealing with fine grade silica sand, which is used in glass making, but also really is like a fine grade beach sand. And what you'll find when you excavate these sites by, sh by shovel in particular is that, again, you can take the extra care that's necessary to, uh, to, to carve away the edges. And uh, I will be completely honest with you, uh, out of the probably 500 burials we performed in, in Steelman Town, we've never had a collapse. We've never had any type of significant collapse in any grave excavating. A matter of fact, probably the worst we've ever had would have been possibly maybe uh, a four or five inch section that might just, a little small section that might come off the wall, but never anything significant. Uh, but again, you know, in the Cape, I'm, I'm sure that you would experience the same types of soil or very similar. You can see also to the left of the gentleman in the orange shirt, you can see a little bit of, uh, of uh, gravel in, mixed in that as well. Uh, but once you, re once you reach the sand, uh, Pretty much that's all that you'll encounter the digging, at least at Steelman Town and, and possibly in your areas as well. Ed, do you ever uh, have graves right next to each other that you end up digging? Uh, absolutely. And, and that was something that I was going to mention. Uh, you know, I don't know how your cemeteries are laid out or how you uh, intend on selling grave sites. In Steelman Town, people can choose their location, and it's 13 acres, so it's rather large. Uh, not large, big cemetery standards, but not a bad size. So you don't get a lot of graves that are right next to each other, but some cemeteries will sell graves in sequence. Uh, if you're going to sell graves in sequence, uh, my suggestion to you would be that you would probably want to, now, typically a natural burial grave is the site itself is a little larger than a typical grave site. That, that's not a necessity or a requirement, but most natural burial grave sites are five by 10. Obviously in a, a, a traditional cemetery, that would be more like three by eight. Uh, but we do dig graves next to each other uh, in the historical section in particular, where you're seeing this grave being, uh, where these grave sites are three by 10. Now, the, the probably the biggest difference is because we dig these by hand, and typically a shrouded body or a uh, casketed body is going in with no vault. The grave size itself does not have to be as large as the traditional grave site it would need to be. So typically we can dig these per the size of the individual that's going into the grave site. So with that being said, if you're opening a grave site that is 30 inches wide and the next grave site is, and the grave sites are three by 10, Typically, you're going to have about uh, a foot to maybe 14 to 16 inches separating the two grave sites. Uh, we have had to excavate these on occasion, uh, kind of close together within six months, and uh, again, have never experienced uh, any kind of cave-in or anything to that effect. Uh, I know that we're going to come to the slide a little later on, showing up some shoring mechanisms. Uh, I could give you some opinions concerning that, but... Uh, but I think the biggest thing that we have to have to uh, talk about really is also uh, your ground rule. Uh, you know, obviously, if you are encountering ground where levels at a high high level in the soil, say you you dig down and your high ground is at three feet, that could pose a problem. Certainly, if you're going to continue to try to dig, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure if Massachusetts has rules and regulations concerning the depth of a vaultless burial. Some states do, some states don't. Massachusetts But uh, not most certainly, if you can reach a depth of three. Okay, good. So if you can, if, say in the, in the middle of winter, uh, and you're digging on the Cape, and you're experiencing seasonal high groundwater at, let's say, three, between three and four feet, uh, we, we, we do on occasion experience groundwater at about the three foot level at Steelman Town. But I, I, I want to tell you, it's perfectly acceptable 
to bury an individual uh, at that depth, in particular, uh, you know, shrouded or even in a, a wicker basket or a pine box because the depth of those containers are, are fairly shallow, typically 12 to 14 inches high. So it's not like it's a, a, a large, uh, you know, a large container itself. But also you have to remember that because it's a vaultless burial, you want to put all the earth back on top of that grave site. So as that degrades, as that collapses, uh, gravity will pull all that soil back into the grave site. So it's not, uh, it's not really something that's going to be uh, dangerous to the visitors there uh, if it were to collapse or anything like that. Some cemeteries may feel as if that's uh, unsightly because they're used to uh, the lawn cemetery look when you remove it and they nice sod or plant grass seed. But if you're going to embrace the concept, uh, you know, you have to you have to embrace the idea that there will be a burial mound. And typically uh, what we do at Steelman Town is, is decorate that with native greenery uh, to make it look beautiful. Uh, so it, it's not so stark or jumping out at you. But, you know, if you're experiencing water at a higher level than that, uh, then I would assume just like digging a hole at the beach, if you have sandy soil, if you continue to dig at that point, I'm most certain that you probably would experience some uh, collapse of the walls as you try to go deeper uh, into that grave site mm -hmm. itself. Okay, thanks. And, and Ed, the next slide is the one with the shoring of the, the graves, or in this case, it's a construction site. And given your background in construction, I know you're familiar with these things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly this could be accomplished if it was, if you were experiencing, if you had to get to a certain depth and you were experiencing a lot of collapse or cave-in, uh, you know, this application itself wouldn't be the one that I would uh, suggest. Most certainly it works for construction workers. Uh, you know, what I would suggest to the, to this group in particular, because you're using something that you want to be biodegradable, would be uh, a system that possibly would be made out of a hem fur and maybe some hem fur four by four blocking that you could shore it up. Uh, whether or not you could remove that as you backfill the grave could be a possibility, uh, it, you know, but it, you may, it may be necessary to leave a good portion of that in the grave site itself, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know that you would have to experience this. I really don't, unless you're working in a cemetery that for some unknown reason, uh, either requires grave sites to be sold in sequence, or uh, possibly if you've buried someone in a grave site that's a three foot wide grave site and say their loved one passes away, you know, within weeks or months of that burial. Uh, but if you, if you take care and you do this by hand, uh, certainly in, in our experiences, uh, we have not had any issue with it at all, but that might sound like a very arguous task for the cemetery crew to, to envision, envision digging these by hand. But I can tell you this, and again, this isn't a, a monetary thing, but I just want to mention it. Uh, if you have to uh, dig it by hand and it's going to cost the cemetery more because of labor or something like that, most certainly you could adjust that you know, as a grave opening fee when it comes to natural burial itself. So just keep that in mind. So I, I do know there's been some issues in Provincetown. They, they, they did approve green burial and there were digging problems um, and collapsing problems. So um, we, we can talk about that in a, in a little bit. I, I hope who's ever been digging graves at Provincetown might be able to share us some information with us. And Barry, I understand you're on the call and um, you have been doing some grave digging on the Lower Cape. Um, do you have anything to, to add to what Ed is talking about? Barry, you're muted. Can you Barry, this Barry, there's a microphone, the look of a microphone on the bottom of your screen, and it might have a red line through it. If you click on that, we can then perhaps hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I have never used Cribbon on the Cape. I know Provincetown does use it because their soil is very sandy. 
Um, but I've never used it. I've had a little bit of cave-in problems in Wellfleet, uh, Truro, but when you get towards the mid-cape area, the ground is really stable. And um, I don't know what else to say about it other than if you're only going to go three and a half, four feet deep, you really don't need the cribbing to hold the walls up. Okay, great. In my experience. Uh huh. And so, what kind of equipment are you using? Well, my first 20 years when I was doing around 400 a year, I was using machinery. But the last 20 years, I've dug them by hand. I had no idea. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I've never, I've always gone five feet deep because we've installed vaults. And I've done three green burials, and those were all in South Wellfleet Cemetery. Uh -huh. and, and how uh, deep were those? Those I went four feet. Yeah. And, and you dug those were, by hand? Yes, I did. So, so when you're doing your the conventional burials, you must be using um, some type of heavy equipment to install the concrete boxes, right? Well, I didn't, the last 20 years, I didn't, I gave up the installation of the vaults myself. Okay. And they would hire a, a company, a vault company that came and they put it in with a truck usually. Okay. And this, this is David again, Chuck Cole, who is the, uh, manager of the South Wellfleet Cemetery is on this Zoom meeting as well, just for your information. Yes. Great, thank you. Chuck, did you wanna add something? Uh, yeah, I remember when Barry dug the grave, well, I think it was Bob Payne's grave up, up in, uh, in South Wellfleet. He had six and a half foot two by 12s. So that must have been one of those where the sand might have gotten soft toward the bottom, but it seemed pretty simple where you just stacked them against the sidewalls and that was enough to be care. So that's the cribbing I think you were speaking of, right, Barry? Yes, I, I would put planking around the edge of the hole right. to walk on. Okay. Because if you walk up to the edge of a grave on the bare ground, you have a better chance of your weight cave in the wall down. Okay. Uh -huh. So I would put two header planks and two planks on each side of the opening, which supported people or the Lauren device and the casket. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. This is, this is pretty cool. Okay, great. So we don't see those in this particular image. No. Um, because this this was uh, this was not for a real grave. Um, yeah, and this was part of the back door process as well. We would mm -hmm. remove them as the family. Uh, okay, you remove them for the back door process when you invite the family to fill in the grave. <clears throat> and I I just want to advance to this slide. So these planks are on the sides of the graves. This is what you were just talking about, Barry. Yes. Um, and in this case, here's a, a steel cast, uh, excuse me, a wicker casket at Steelman Town. I can and see they've put two planks just across the opening. Mm -hmm. Like they, they don't have them down the side. I'm, I'm, I'm you not mean, sure you, if I'm explaining correctly, but I would have a header plank at each end, uh -huh. and two planks that rested on top of the header planks on each side, you know, okay. stage planks. So you'd have about a foot and, a, you know, foot and a half on each side of plankage that you could walk on and, and, put things on 
like a mm -hmm. lower end device. But right. I see, I see there they have two planes across and they must lower it in with a rope or a strap. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. Ed, do you want to talk about your lowering process? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, we do everything by hand and we don't use the lowering device at any of our facilities. So essentially kind of very similar to what Barry said, you know, we just, we created uh, about two foot wide uh, planks that go on each side, bolted together. Uh, they, they stabilize not only the ground, like Barry said, so it doesn't collapse, but uh, also stabilize it for the family so they can actually stand on them, have enough room so it's not clumsy or you know feeling like they can't stand or off balance. Everyone raises the basket with the ropes. We pull out the planks. Uh, they lower it down. At the bottom of the grave site would be a couple of uh, you know like pine logs that would allow us enough space to pull the ropes back out. And then we remove the larger planks when the family is ready to back for the grave itself. And uh, and we just fill it in. And all the all the soil goes back in where how it came out. And uh, and I'm. And like, I'm not surprised to hear Barry say that they don't really have issues with, or too many issues with collapse. Cause like I said, I believe the soils are very similar. And I think probably the greatest difference between Provincetown and, and in the middle of the Cape and, and here in South Jersey is that, cause I have been to Provincetown and I think I've been to that cemetery. It looks like a giant sand dune to me, a beach sand. So I'm, I think the soil there, and I could be entirely wrong by saying that, but I remember it seemed very, very sandy. And that type of sand could be a little more unstable, in my opinion. Uh, but I'd be interested to hear what the gentleman says about about that, you know, a little later on. At, at one point, Ed, I thought I understood you may also, it sounds like you don't do this, but I thought I also understood you would have planks sometimes inside the grave itself to help shore up the walls. But, but it sounds like you do not do that. No, we've never had any instance to have to do that. Uh, at any of, you know, even at any of our facilities, uh, we've never had to shore up any of the grave sites. Uh, again, you know, I think that the only time that I would really seriously consider doing that uh, would be if someone had recently been buried adjacent in a small grave site. Uh, and, you know, we would just want to be sure, but we've never had that issue because we've always left it out at least a foot between the two. And again, like I had mentioned earlier, with natural burial and with digging these by hand, uh, you know, you're not putting a, a big concrete vault in. So, you know, we literally ask, you know, what size container are, is the decedent gonna be in? So we know how large to open the grave. Sometimes they're only 28 inches wide. It really depends on the individual. Mm -hmm. And New Jersey does have a depth requirement of five feet, correct? That's correct. It, a vaultless burial, they they uh, they would like to see it at five feet, uh, you know. But again, you know, there has to be there has to be concessions, unfortunately, at times, uh, you know, because you will encounter groundwater in New Jersey, no doubt, and uh, and you have to do what you have to do in the time you know. So, <laughs> as a cem all cemeterians know, uh, you know, when you have that job, you have to get that job done. Too. So, uh, but. I, a minimum of four feet, in my personal opinion. You know, I'm glad to hear Massachusetts doesn't have that. Uh, we do dig to a depth of five feet uh, on typical grave sites. But when we do hit water, uh, occasionally, you know, unfortunately, when we hit the water, we really can go no farther than that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I loved about your cemetery, Ed, is you also had like this image on the on the left is showing you have some forest burials that you allow. Um, can you describe a little bit about how you go about identifying where those burials might go? Okay, sure, absolutely. So we do have off-trail burial available. Uh, you know, we do things the old-fashioned way. We survey it. I mean, uh, certainly GPS can be used. We don't use GPS systems. Uh, we survey it the old-fashioned way and the family receives a large map showing the surveyed location and the coordinates to, you know, to go to that location itself. And uh, we do everything in five foot increments as well. So uh, part of that process is when, 
when you're traveling to that grave site, it will show a distance. And uh, for instance, if, it, if uh, a grave site, and it would start at 100 feet and at 105, if it's an individual grave site itself. And I also like that you don't let people go into the woods. You put it on the edge of the path. Absolutely, and we have a reason for that as well. You know, uh, the picture with the wicker basket is in our historic section, which is laid out in a grid. So that is laid out like a traditional cemetery with rows and, you know, more of a high density burial. Uh, with the path system, if, if your cemetery chooses to do this, you know, uh, we like to keep it right along the path so the family can find their loved one. But also, uh, we don't want it to get willy nilly in the sense that we put people in locations that people become confused, they can't find it, it's difficult for us to survey. It's much more not manageable, you know, for your cemetery itself to do it this way. And then most certainly if the cemetery fills up at some point, uh, you know, you can always change the path to expand further into the, uh, into the forest if you need to. Great, thank you, Ed. Is there anything else we missed that, that you'd like to say? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think that, again, I appreciate you guys having me. I think we share the similar experience uh, with the soils in particular, without a doubt, and, and really geography as well, I think, uh, the nature anyway. Uh, but no, I, I just want, I would like to say just again to the commissioners and to the cemetery people here, uh, believe me, uh, you know, I started in, uh, in New Jersey doing this in 2007. And now, you know, I've spread across the nation and, and I actually have four more facilities that are going to be coming online within the next three or four months. You're kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Another one in California, one in Southern California. Well, two in California, one in uh, Humboldt County, one in uh, Los Angeles, and then Minnesota and, and Wisconsin with some international and the reason I, I mentioned this is you're going to find by, by offering this, again, it's, it's going to be a very fulfilling experience for you, but it's going to help the cemetery as well. Uh, green burial, and, and again, I mentioned this to the cemetery people, just so you can hear it come from me. Green burial does not mean that you're wasting space, you know, by not high density. Green burial does not mean that it's a uh, cheap burial. Uh, I don't mean that it's expensive either, but most certainly uh, I think for the cemetery itself, you can have an offering that can bring you a very good revenue stream so that will help you maintain and do all the things that you need to do and continue the life of the cemetery by offering something that is certainly up and coming. You're gonna get more and more people. Uh, the more people who experience it, the more people who will ask for it and be ahead of the curve by embracing the concept now, don't find yourself five years from now saying, oh, geez, I would have listened. I should have listened back then, uh, you know, take the initiative. But no, I think that's it. I think, I think that's covered it. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. If you can stick around to help answer some questions that I suspect might be coming, that would be fabulous. Sure, absolutely. Um, I want to bring up Chesterfield, Massachusetts just for a moment. It's up in Western Massachusetts. And they were one of the first cemeteries to allow green burial. And I wanted to highlight this bottom rule or regulation that they have related to green burial, which basically says they still have the prerogative to install a grave liner if one is needed. Um, and I, I guess I mentioned that because I know Provincetown has had issues and we still want all of these things to be safe for the people digging the grave and for the people who might be filling in the grave. So that's why I just wanted to bring it up is, is if you need to change rules and regulations, you know, having some type of statement like this might be important as part of your, your rule. And I also want to invite Sophia to say a few words about Brewster. Sophia, you're on. Okay, hi. I want to thank Ed and Barry. That was so useful and helpful for me to hear what you had to say. Um, so yeah, I'm on the commission in Brewster and actually Green Barrel has been approved in Brewster 
we have a section set aside there since 2006, but um, that was way before my time. Um, and I joined, I think in 2018, the commission and we started looking at the rules and we decided to redo them in uh, March, 2019. And you can go online on the Cemetery Commission website and see what those rules are if you're interested. We used actually um, as a starting point, something that Candace suggested and then adapted them to the needs of Brewster and the situation on the ground there where we don't have you know, a sexton or anything. So we kind of thought about what would be neat, you know, going through the steps of what happens for Green Burial and Brewster and how to make that work for us. And then, and I mean, I could tell, tell you more details but I won't unless there's interest. Um, so we spent about six months working on revising the rules. We went to the select board and had them approved. They, they were very enthusiastic and, and helpful, made some edits and adopted them officially in January, 2020. And um, we're really excited about it in Brewster. We've sold five plots now in area C and we've had one green barrel, which went without a hitch. And um, probably the, the only challenge has been interestingly finding people who are willing to dig for green burial and so what i'm so excited for this you know actual information about it i know barry has talked to me several times very um nicely of him to share his wealth of experience that you know why wouldn't you it's it's easier to dig a green burial in brewster our regulations do call for a three and a half foot deep grave and um as Ed was just saying, you know, the grave is smaller. It only has to be the size of the actual casket. Um, so I think it's just education and that's why I'm really excited to hear this information. I'm hoping to, uh, it gets around. And um, yeah, so that's, that, that's all really I have to say. If anyone had any questions, I'd be happy to answer them if I can. Barry, I would love to know if you have an apprentice um, I do have someone who has an interest in, uh, because I just retired from doing the burials about a year ago. Hmm. I thought 40 years was enough. <laughs> and, um, and plus, plus my dad and my grandfather did it. Uh -huh. So, um, but uh, I do have someone that, I have gotten him into doing cremation burials and he mm -hmm. has had an interest in doing the green burials because as Sophia was saying, she was having a tough time to find someone to do them. And I, which I don't understand, but um, so. So when you say Barry, that you're doing the burials, do you mean you're digging as well as you're helping to lower the body or are you not involved in that part? I am involved in, in that part, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, and but, so that might uh, be- Go ahead. I was wondering, you know, is it the lowering of the shrouded body perhaps that is turning people off who, who, who think that they don't- Well, that anything? could be part of it. Um, mm -hmm. I given some thought about that lower in a shrouded body. I would think you'd have to have some kind of a degrade biodegradable platform. You, mm -hmm. I just couldn't imagine putting a rope, say, around the under the knees and the back of a shrouded body and try lowering it that way. I just don't think it would be very dignified. Right, Ed, can you comment on that? Well, absolutely. Yeah, typically, uh, there's many ways you can do it. Uh, the field director themselves can put a, uh, a pine uh, board into the shroud. Sometimes they're sewn into the shroud itself already to stabilize the body so they don't have to have the tray. Uh, a lot of companies now sell the tray uh, with the shroud, so it just comes with it, so that for the ease of lowering. But I will tell you this. Uh, you know, because natural burial knows no religions or sexuality or anything else, uh, you know, we have lowered many, many, many bodies into the grave sites uh, without any kind of backboard. And, there's, and I can just mention a couple things that we do. Certainly, if it's a Muslim burial, 
uh, and we do a lot of those. The Muslim faith, uh, they like to get down into the grave site and lower the body themselves. So there is no uh, you know, use of lowering device or ropes. Uh, now in the Jewish faith, many times with, uh, with the Orthodox, the ultra Orthodox that I have, uh, I have been able to serve, they wanted nothing. They actually used something that's very similar to a bed sheet. So it doesn't look like a traditional shroud that's very tight. Uh, and we use four ropes in lowering the individual. And there is a, a way to place the ropes. And like Barry said, you know, to, uh, to people who are not used to seeing that, that may not seem dignified or the right way to do it. But for the individuals that, the, the faiths that have done it in the past, it's, it's not an issue. But you certainly have to know how to do it. So uh, if anyone ever had to experience that, I could, I could certainly help you and, and let you know. But you use four ropes in that instance. So, but that's, that's our experience with it. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sophia and Barry. And this, this is David yes. again. Yes, uh, David. I just wanted to mention, without putting uh, Chris or Lynn from Provincetown Cemetery Commission on the spot, if there's time, it might be interesting for them to give a short overview of the process they went through to submit for permission, getting permission from the town, and then revising their procedures for green burials to accommodate some of the uh, the. the land issues, but so just to know that there are a couple of people from Provincetown on this Excellent. as well. Okay, great. Thank you, David. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to P-Town at the end. Great, thank you. Uh, because I, I see the time here is already 10.55. Um, so I know there are some questions around chemotherapy drug uh, drugs and drinking water supply. And I had spoken with um, a couple of retired soil scientists. So they're not able to be here. Um, I also spoke with somebody from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection and they're also not able to be here. And um, so what I'm sharing with you is information that they offered um, and nothing's definitive. And it, it turns out there's, there's, there's still a lot of study to be done about cemeteries and water issues or non-issues. Um, and so what we know, Dana-Farber reports that most chemotherapy drugs remain in the body for only a few hours a day. So, and this is uh, typically true also if you are a mother who's breastfeeding and also going through chemotherapy, they suggest that waiting 72 hours after a treatment would be um, the time period to wait before you can start breastfeeding again. So um, most of the chemicals are being excreted in urine, stool, or, or sweat, according to Dana-Farber. And one of the soil scientists I spoke to, you know, he talked about that, yes, soil is a, a fabulous filter, um, particularly the, the top soils. And he's thinking that for the, in most cases, there might be a very small amount of drugs within the body that's being buried. And so the, the, the risk is small because the number of bodies would be small in this particular instance. And the World Health Organization, so they're looking at the entire world, right? We're not just talking about Massachusetts. And I'm bringing this report up because it, this was written in 1998, so over 20 years ago. And it was cited by a, a Muslim burial group who wanted to have a cemetery in Walpole. And it, did not pass because the cemetery was too close to some private wells, as well as a, a public water source. And there were also some uh, delineated wetlands on the property. And then, so that was 2014. Then in 2016, the community tried again to create a cemetery in Dudley, Massachusetts. This was quite an ordeal. 
and it, it took a couple of years. And the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection ultimately approved the site, but it was fairly arduous to and expensive to do the recommendations. And part of what they're saying, the World Health Organization is saying is, well, you know, cemeteries are a special kind of landfill. And so we wanna protect our water sources. We all know we need to protect our water sources. And so finding the right soils and the, the proper way of handling this is really important. And so they drafted a bunch of ideas that they thought would be appropriate as potential um, design ideas for all cemeteries, including um, being 820 feet from any well, borehole, or spring from a potable water supply. Um, they included um, all burial pits on site must maintain a minimum of 3.2 feet of subsoil below the bottom of the pit. And then the base of the pit must be at least one meter above solid rock. Okay, and then they also talk about maintaining minimum clearance above the highest natural water table. And they also talked about um, uh, building up the the, the amount of soil, uh, where is this? I can also share this PDF with people afterwards, or you can find the report online, it's still available online. But my, my point to bring this up is basically Massachusetts DEP, they took these recommendations and said, okay, um, Islamic group, you can use this site in Dudley, but you're gonna to have to raise the level of the earth to be well above the water table. And then you need to make sure you have more organic matter on top of those graves. So this became cost prohibitive to the group and they ended up being able to have a portion of a cemetery in Worcester, Massachusetts. So they didn't, they didn't get exactly what they wanted. Um, and there are still no super clear guidelines for defining a new cemetery in Massachusetts. But I can tell you it involves working with the regional DEP office as well as the local Department of Health. But the final rubber stamp comes from the Massachusetts DEP. And so similarly, the soil scientist I spoke to, he suggested that, you know, if you have uh, really permeable soil. You might want to have some loamy topsoil below the body as well as around the body with an organic, organic matter content of 4% or greater. And the reason being is those microbes in that good soil will um, support the decomposition process and slow down the permeability of sandy soils. So it, it sounds like this isn't required for most of um, where Barry's digging soils. And, um, but it, it could be the case in, in P-Town. And so I just also wanted to bring up, you know, Pleasant Hill, I understand, is where we're talking about right now of adding green burials in the town of Wellfleet. So I am now ready to open it up and get some other questions if you would like. Um, and, and oh, the soil scientists from looking at the maps, he, he doesn't know your area, um, but he does suggest that the aquifer, I know the Cape has a sole source aquifer, is probably somewhere around 70 feet deep at this location. <clears throat> And he's making that guess based on the, the type of soils, the superficial geology, and the topography in the area. This screenshot is coming from uh, Massachusetts GIS. And there are these purple circles. These are related to um, public well supplies, I believe, or at least areas that the 
DEP, Massachusetts DEP, the regional office cares about. So it's not within the confines of the cemetery. And that's a good thing. Can I interject for a moment? This is Barry. Go for it, Barry. Okay, I will say on the Cape, if you notice most of the cemeteries were built on the highest ground in the town. Hmm. Orleans, Wellfleet, Truro, they're all at the highest points. You know what I mean? Yes, excellent okay. point. And uh, I think our forefathers knew why they put them on the highest <laughs> ground. Yeah. Because they realized that uh, one source of water was the aquifer. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a few places where they haven't been so conscientious about that. But for the most part, all cemeteries I find on the Cape are built on the highest points of the town. Mm. I Thank just you. wanted to put that out there. Yeah, excellent. And this it's David Agger again. You and I talked regarding this map, this plot map of the town that of also particular interest for Wellfleet is, as we're looking at the screen to the right, really underneath the text that you have there is where the town water tower is. And then farther to the right would be where the well is, but it's well out of the uh, DEP's concern at this point. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, David. Are you ready for questions? I am. So if people would like to ask a question, I've, I, I'm happy to call on people as you raise your hand. Mm -hmm. And again, on my screen, on the bottom, there's a little pop-up that says reactions with a smiley face. If you click on that, it will give you the hands up option. I think I might stop sharing my screen, but um, so I can see everybody. Just to remind people, we are a nonprofit. We're not scientists. And we will encourage all kinds of scientific study. And we are working to establish a conservation burial ground in Massachusetts. So. Okay, Candace, we've got Mark who is, is involved with the private Orleans Cemetery. Mark, welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can yes. hear you. Okay, great. I just have, I have three quick questions I'd like to lay out for whomever might be interested in answering them. Um, I'm interested to know what the burial field will, what do you anticipate that the burial field will look like 10 or 15 years down the road? Um, the second one is how have, uh, how have you dealt or how has anybody dealt with the objection of the lack of uh, markers? Because you, I, obviously you don't have a firm base to put in uh, grave markers um, or memorial pieces. And then the last is um, down the road, um, family members come to identify the family plot and they haven't been here before. How do they identify the family grave site when they come in, um, say a decade from now? Thank you. Would you like me to answer this, Candace? Sure, go for it, Ed. <clears throat> so, so as far as the burial site is concerned, Typically within 12 to 18 months, the soil goes back into the grave site because you place it on top and becomes perfectly level again. Uh, so you're not going to have anything that's going to resemble a, a greatly disturbed area or, you know, some people have this imagination that, you know, they'll have 10,000 burials. That's not how it works. And you know that in the cemetery business. So it, it will look very natural and, and, and it will go back to its original uh, surface, essentially. As far as a monumentation is concerned, we only allow natural field stones. Uh, so a natural field stone at our facilities doesn't have a, you know, a, a tremendous weight and we do allow those to be engraved. So the family does have permanent uh, marking, uh, just is not allowed to be polished or set in concrete. Certainly your facility might want to do it differently, I understand, but uh, but we've never had any issues with individuals finding family members. Uh, if they do have a problem, all they have to do is call the office to be directed to the gravesite itself. But you know, we do provide the direct family with 
uh, surveys showing how to get to those spots. And probably 95% of the individuals do choose to have markers. So it's not like you have a large area of unmarked graves. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, I, wanna, I wanna add to that also, um, I have a feeling you were wondering about 10 to 15 years out, you're wondering about the popularity of green burial perhaps, Mark? Um, um, yes and no, we, uh, we've talked about it a little bit and we know we would put it off, uh, off to the side of, what, of our current um, oh, okay. area if we were to go with this, but the, uh, I'm, I was just kind of wondering if it looked like a, a you know, a, a play yard or, you know, just an open field or, a, you know, what, how does one envision the final product when it begins to mature? Uh, um, yes, it, it, it could, it could look like a, a meadow. It could be part of a forest. You could be re replanting an area that was even perhaps a, potentially a brown field of sorts. Um, you, you have what, what's appealing to many green burial advocates is the idea of restoring something to the way it was. And so it, it doesn't need to look like a conventional cemetery at all. And I know at, also at Ed's cemetery, he's not putting foundations under these stones. So over time, they might sink a little bit, they might be covered up by leaves. And, you know, maybe a family member will come and take the leaves off. But um, we, we also know, I, I had worked at Mount Auburn Cemetery for about 20 years. And when we, implemented green burials there, we did not allow any kind of marker. And that was heresy to a lot of people because the family members wanted to come back and they needed that physical touchstone to know where their loved one was. So, you know, having a, you know, a tree label, sometimes that was sufficient, but mostly what happened is a, a ledger stone that could fit maybe 30 names on it was added nearby in the landscape. And so this group marker became used for many unrelated people just to acknowledge that who's buried in the area. So that, that seemed to satisfy most of those people who wanted natural burial and wanted to have their name engraved in stone for their families. And Mount Auburn puts uh, foundations under their memorial markers. I know Ed does not put any kind of foundation under his, his markers. Candice, uh, Sophia wanted to add something, I think, to that. I was just going to say to Mark that in Brewster, in our rules, we have that you can use a flat stone, but no foundation, but the graves will be marked. If, if the family wants, the graves can be marked. So that's, uh -huh. yeah. Great. Uh, Thank you. Before I call the next person, I just want to remind people who are new to this conversation that on the outer, lower and outer cape, Orleans and East Dam, their, their historic town cemeteries are not open for business in the sense that they are, are not putting any new graves in there. But so the two active cemeteries, well, the active cemeteries for those two towns are private. And, yeah. and so that's an interesting conversation that Mark and some of the people from East Ham are having because they aren't town, they're private, they're private yeah. property as long as well as South Wellfleet. Uh, I'm going to change my rule, which was to call on cemetery people first, because we don't have a lot of people. So Helen Miranda Wilson. Hi, thanks. I have a question. Um, generally, if there is an existing plot, for example, I own a plot here in Wellfleet, and my parents are both buried on it, but it's a pretty big plot. If there is room, is there anywhere, and could we do it here, that you're allowed to have a green burial on a plot that has a conventional burial or two already there having been done. In other words, if there's enough room. So I'll go ahead and handle that as one of the three wealthy cemetery commissioners in a sense that we, we haven't gotten to that point in terms of coming up with guidelines or rules and regulations. I think if and when it happened, if it happens, we were also thinking a separate part of the cemetery, a part that has not been used at all yet. But we could, but that conversation hasn't happened yet, Helen. Yes, but my question was to these other people who were here now. Oh, ah, good. Yeah, is this happening anywhere else? Thank you. 
Um, uh, I can answer that for you if you'd like me to. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have hybrid model cemeteries, uh, one in Portland, Oregon, one in California, one in Pennsylvania. And we most certainly allow natural burial uh, within those traditional cemetery areas. And uh, it has posed no, pro no problem whatsoever. It really, you know, every cemetery, it's just their own uh, rules and regulations. And, and they can certainly be changed as the commissioners know that, you know, at, at meetings. So it can certainly be possible. Yeah, thank you. Chuck Cole. Ed, Ed, we're in South Wellfleet, we're one of those few rural cemeteries because the last couple generations, we haven't had many meetings. But <laughs> the, the survey was done in 1976. And one person that I would have loved to have at this meeting is Don Walsh from Provincetown, who's such an advocate for alternative views of burials and, and uh, managing cemeteries. She came to our cemetery a few uh, year ago, just out of her two, two years ago out of general interest. And while looking at the survey, which ours was surveyed when most of the grave sites were 10 by 20, which allowed for six burials. Ours now have gone into, I've actually designated most of those plots, which was our traditional size, to 10 by 10s. Um, so there's no uh, alleyway between those A and B sections. But when I was talking with Don, I realized that where the main part of our historic and our current burial cemetery are designated in roads and paths and that sort of thing. Behind our back fence between us and the bike trail was given to our cemetery years ago. So we own it as part of the cemetery and it is woods. We're talking pine trees, oh, a foot and a half, some of them two feet in diameter. So we're are looking toward making those regulations at our at our annual meeting say and but Don gave me a really beautiful vision of like the cart that you had at Steelentown with the uh, the big wheels you can have a path to take the body in by hand and I've actually sold two plots in that section people who aren't looking for a burial in in a short amount of time and we certainly are going to have to have a work party to go out and clear the brush because that is woods right now and my guesstimation on our discussions will be that we'll say no trees larger than whatever size six inches say will be removed and i so far i'm just selling 10 by 10 plots we've always encouraged people to put in corner posts so that they know where their 10 by 10 is but we have no regulations of what that can look like sometimes it's been natural wood. Um, somebody used maple last year. Somebody else used PVC pipe and concrete. Everybody has their own, you know, what, what they want with their cemetery. But behind our back fence will be our arboreal, our forest cemetery. And I'm just looking forward to that as a, but we have no regulations within our cemetery as to whether to have to be green or otherwise. Um, and I was surprised to have to put in a vault last year and we ha and to get to that grave, I had hoped to sell that section just to people who were cremating because it was broom crowberry and heaths and heathers and hog cranberry was the ground cover. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we had to put the, the vault in a holding area, lay down plywood so they could quickly get in with small equipment to get that concrete vault in. But you always damage the, and the berry is so good when he does a hand burial. He does as best as he can in a in a, an area that shouldn't probably have a full burial because the hog cranberry it'll never come back. Um, but Barry has has done beautifully in our cemetery in the past. I appreciate his work um, when somebody was willing to have a hand hand burial. So that's sort of where we are. But we're definitely looking forward to and I'm going to look at your regulations as toxic chemicals because I can see our board perhaps making a designation that we'd, we'd prefer that. We won't have that in the arboreal section. And mm -hmm. whether we would prohibit it in our main cemetery is, I think as Ed said, it's up to us uh, to make that. Mm -hmm. We've we just been very slow to make regulations. Our people are, are more born into the cemetery than they are having to uh, sign up and get voted in on the on the ballot, which a lot mm -hmm. of people get on cemetery commissions that way. So. We don't have 
sort of that inbred feeling of your job <laughs> is to make regulations. So. Uh -huh. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Come and, come and visit our cemetery anytime. <laughs> okay, will do. Debbie uh, Abbott from East Ham. Yes, hi, I'm Debbie Abbott. I'm the clerk at Evergreen Cemetery in East Ham, which most of you know is private. It's the only active one in East Ham right now. And we have been, our board has been talking about green burials now for more than a year. And in fact, we've sold eight plots to people that we were, they're in a holding pattern because they want to do green burials. Um, we went to the, uh, uh, the select board in the fall and Sophia came to our November 2nd select board meeting where we wanted to just present the idea to the select board to find out um, what they're feeling about it. And they were ecstatic to talk about it, very interested in it, absolutely fully support us going forward to it. And in fact, they actually, um, somebody who uh, um, in East Ham, who's not only what at that time was the chairman of the Board of Health and also on open space committee, and on the Conservation Foundation board, um, they're actually looking at sometime down the road after things calm down a little bit, the possibility of East Ham itself um, using possibly some of their open space with this mm -hmm. idea, which obviously is way mm -hmm. in the future. They'd rather see us do it first <laughs> is the bottom line. But we're definitely um, going, you know, going forward with the idea and we'll be discussing it at our annual meeting in May, um, yeah, that, what the next terrific. step is. And yeah, we have awesome. two different areas in the cemetery that um, one of them is, and I'm interested in listening to Chuck because one of them is a wooded area on the east side that goes all along Gray Pond Road that hasn't been touched. Um, and my preference would be to create something in there, but we also do have another section. Um, and it's our board generally feels like they would like to have it separate, that they somehow think that, um, um, you know, for the people looking at doing green burials that they would um, like a separate area rather than as Ed mentioned, a hybrid with having, um, and that, I think that might be a selling point too, is having it be separate. But we're going forward with it. Excellent, that's great news. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if Chris or Lynn from P-Town are here. Uh, Chris, Chris stepped out, but I believe Lynn is here. Are you, Lynn, are you in a position to make any comments? I don't see them on the screen. Yeah, I think she must have. I, th I think right now P Town is not represented, but if you have any comments or questions, I'm happy to uh, make sure they get them and get a response from them and then send it back to the group. Yeah, so that's great. And I noticed somebody has a question here about tree roots being a problem. Ed, do you um, want to answer a tree root question when you're digging in the sure. forest? Sure, absolutely. And and again, I think that we're fortunate that our uh, that we're very similar, you know, to South Jersey is very similar to your environment. Uh, quite honestly, if you're in, in a an old growth forest or or a forest that maybe has uh, maybe not old growth but maybe grew back in the last fifty years, you know, between the types of trees that we have, especially along the coastline, you know, the, uh, the large pines and, and the oak trees and things like that, they they have a different type of root system and the luxury, I should say, of having different types of root systems where they don't spread outwardly. They typically go down looking for the, the water source itself. Pine trees, their they're, uh, they're roots and their stump in particular, like a carrot. So you really shouldn't have a tremendous amount of problems Digging in the forest, uh, you know, rule of thumb is, uh, you know, try to stay a moderate distance. Maybe if you, let's say you had a, a, a pine tree that was in circumference of a foot and a half, like, uh, like Chuck had mentioned, uh, you know, we would stay probably a distance of three to five feet away from that, the base of that tree. You're going to find as you're digging in this environment that you're not really going to hit a lot of roots. You'll be actually shocked how few roots you actually hit. Uh, 
you know, you'll hit some surface roots between uh, one foot and 18 inches. And typically those are the feeder roots that, you know, that search for nutrients for the tree. So, uh, you know, because it's not a high density situation, I would, you know, we've never had trees die from burial. Uh, that's just another thing for you to know. We've never had that instance. So I don't really foresee you having many problems. If you were in a different location where the trees were not getting their worse from, from below, but more stretching out, it could be more of a, a hard problem to dig and also be very detrimental to the tree itself. But I think you guys probably have cedars and pines. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah, I just want to add, you know, Mount Auburn Cemetery is not just a cemetery, it's also a botanic garden, and they are always digging graves near tree roots. And um, occasionally, if it's a large six or eight inches tree root that they encounter, they might move the grave a little bit if they can. Otherwise, if they're able to, they will actually take a handsaw and make a clean cut of that root. And that's what's important is to make that clean cut. Don't just have somebody dig it and shred it. Make the clean cut and keep track of the trees that you had to cut the roots on. So, right, you don't want to have graves go all around that tree where you end up cutting roots. So there, there is a method to keeping a, a tree root in a clean cut to protect the tree. Uh, uh, Mark, I want to confirm that, Mark, your hand is still up. Do you have a question or not? I get, then Ed, go ahead, Ed Miller. Yes, thank you, David. Um, would it be all right if I directed a question to Chuck Cole about the South Wellfleet Cemetery? Sure, go for it. Um, hi there, Chuck. Hey, how are you doing, Ed? Good to see you here. I'm glad to see you. Um, Chuck, uh, I wanted to ask you about the South Wellfleet Cemetery Association. Um, according to the GuideStar, the organization that tracks information about nonprofits, your nonprofit status was revoked by the IRS because of failure to uh, submit required forms. I'm just wondering if you are planning to reapply for nonprofit status for the Cemetery Association. Yes, we will. We, we actually did, went through that process with the Neighborhood Association. It was never revoked, but we've maintained it. And actually, we're sharing a, a post office box. We're not the same organization, but we certainly have many of the same clientele, elders and, and historical people that are in the cemetery. But uh, we, have not, we have not done that as yet. Thank you. I, I, would, I would assume you'd probably looked into that. <laughs> I don't see any other hands up right now. Any other questions or comments for Candace and Judith and Ed and Barry for now? Oops. Stephanie? Uh, yes, uh, Ed had mentioned something about um, uh, in the hand digging, um, being safer, looking for dangers. And I just wondering what you meant by that. As far as, I'm sorry, now you're saying, I, I had mentioned, I, I say take care when you excavate the grave site, so just, you know, very similar to what Candace had said about cutting a tree root. Uh, you know, when you're excavating that grave site, by not using the heavy equipment, uh, you're able to do it in a manner that will keep the st more stability, I would say, you know, to the actual grave site itself. But other than that, uh, there's nothing inherently too inherently dangerous about the grave so you know just just really take your time and, and you know understand how to use a shovel a lot of people don't realize yet there is something to to knowing how to use a shovel <laughs> it's the best way i can put it i was wondering also ed you you have uh, cemeteries in several states uh how did you determine uh, for instance I, i'm from falmouth and we're on a very new, very small committee uh, looking into green burials. And right now we're trying to work with an existing cemetery to get a hybrid. But we also have a 300 committee that purchases uh, land for conservation. And I had in a, a brief conversation with somebody from that committee mentioned uh, something about green burials. So, uh, and our very small new committee thought that would be a very big undertaking. 
but somebody like you who is in the business um, <laughs> you know, to, to look into something like that would be so helpful. Oh, well, most certainly, if you have any questions uh, outside of this conversation, reach out to me. I'd be more than glad to help you out with that. Uh, <laughs> and, and you know, the me, easy, yeah. the, the path, of, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I, I just want to put in a plug for Greenboro, Massachusetts. We are currently working with land trusts here in the western part of the state to open a conservation burial ground. So it would be exactly the type of uh, land you're looking at where we would develop it as open space and do about three to 400 burials per acre of uh, green body burials. Um, so while we're immediately looking in the Pioneer Valley, something on the Cape would be fantastic. And it would, it would also work just to support those cemeteries and towns on the Cape where by state law, a town is supposed to find burial space for its residents, that that's, you know, what each town is supposed to be doing with their cemetery commissioners. Um, having a, a conservation area on the Cape that could be shared by the community would be a benefit. I think it's a fantastic idea. We were also thinking of the business end as well. Uh -huh. That's a whole different um, area, <laughs> the, you know, the selling and the, the upkeep and all of that. So. Yes, yeah, so, so, so we have put together a, a plan, uh, operational plan for here in the Pioneer Valley. Um, we can talk to you also offline to, to let you know our thoughts and how we're thinking about it. And Greenville, Massachusetts has created a 501c3 organization. So that's uh, in the eyes of the IRS, that is a cemetery organization. C13. And, and C13, sorry. Yes, yeah, C13. Um, and so we are prepared to start up a cemetery and operating it ourselves. And um, I would love to think that we could have something like this in every county of the state. Uh, what we know from our constituents here in Massachusetts is that most people like to be buried near where they lived. And so if we can't find it in the town, maybe the county fits. And uh, so that's one of our, our goals. Candace, Candace, I, Candace I want to remind you, well, actually, Judith, oh, you want to okay. say something? Yes, I just wanted to um, uh, say, for those of you who don't know, we are doing a webinar on um, next Thursday on the 25th at 4, 4 o'clock uh, with our partner, Kestrel Land Trust um, and uh, Land Matters. <clears throat> and we're also being co-sponsored co by other land trusts um, in the area, as well as the Mass Land Trust Coalition. So if you're interested in that, we can definitely send you that link. Um, to give you more information about the project and what we're doing. And also, I just wanted to thank you so much for this work that you're doing and that, um, you know, Green Burial Mass has been working with cities and towns for probably 10 years to, you know, we always say cemetery by cemetery, and that's really how this is happening. And so I just really, um, you know, commend you for, for thinking about this and for taking action. And also to thank um, Candace and Sophia for you know what they've brought to the um, to the meeting today. Really valuable information. Uh, thank you, Judith. I, I also I want to acknowledge that it is just past eleven thirty, and I know yeah. Candace and some of her group need to leave. So again, I want to thank you all for coming and sharing your expertise, Candace and Judith and Ed and Barry. And again, before you leave, I just want to mention that. Unless until someone else rises up, I'm happy to be the conduit for passing that information on. So Candith or Judith, okay. if you want to send me that information about the next week meeting and anyone else, if you want, until we establish something else, I'm happy to, to be the conduit. And if someone does not, someone who's on this Zoom meeting today, if you do not want me to pass your email address on to someone else in this group, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll assume that if you were on this Zoom meeting, you're okay with other people in this group, and it might it might bleed out a little bit. So if you're not comfortable, just say, David, please don't pass my contact information on. But what we were thinking was when Green Burial MA leaves, uh, I'm still going to be here. And if people from the different towns want to stay just to check in to give your first reactions or just sort of talk out loud 
about, well, gee, based on what I heard today, I still need more information on this, or I think what I'm gonna propose is this, or the direction I'd like to go is this. Uh, I'm happy to, to be part of that conversation until we have to shut down at one o'clock. Uh, so again, I wanna thank everybody for coming. And uh, you can also let me know what you wanna do in terms of the next step for the Lower Outer Cape cemetery commissioners or other people involved in cemeteries in terms of a future get together meeting or whatever. Candace and Greenberry LMA, do you wanna, any last thoughts or are you done? Uh, I just wanna ditto what Judith said and it's been a real pleasure to talk to everybody and I'm sitting out here in the Berkshires and I find myself really missing the cape right now. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Candace. Okay, and Ed and Barry, thank you so much. Ed, it's nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a year, I think. So, um, wow. so thank, yeah, th thank you so much for participating in this call. I, I know what you shared was valuable. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Green Barrel MA. And uh, Chuck, Chuck, I see has... you and I'll call on you in a minute, but I'm just curious. There are some people who I don't recognize. So I'm just wondering, I know that we have people from Falmouth, from Brewster, from Orleans, East Ham, Wellfleet, and we did have Provincetown. We didn't have anyone from Truro, but I know we'll keep them in touch, but I noticed there are a couple of people like Anne and Liz, who I'm not familiar with. If you could just, and Julie, let me know who you are and how you got here. Hi, this is Anne. <clears throat> Excuse me, can you hear me? I can, yes. Um, so I have joined and I'm going to have to step off for um, another meeting, but David, thank you. Um, I actually am on the board of the Lily House in uh, Provincetown based and I work with Don Walsh in that capacity. I am a resident of Truro and I'm I had mentioned to Dawn that I have sort of an interest in uh, learning more about green burial and potentially, you know, thinking about how that could, I could be helpful in that movement in Truro. Um, very early days in my own learning, um, but she forwarded me the information for this conversation, which has been super interesting. And um, that is why you see my name uh, on the screen and you will see it go away, but my connection to you is through Dawn. Great, thank you, Anne, and do me a favor. Do us a favor, give, a, give people a two sentence description of what Lily House is. I think it's an important part of this whole continuum. Of course, of course. So the Lily House is uh, going to be um, in the fullness of time, a home, a social model hospice care home located on the Outer Cape. And it is a community home for living and dying. Um, the Lily House was formed, uh, Don Walsh, Paula Erickson, and Hannah Ewert are the co-founders. It was formed as a nonprofit um, just a year ago in January and has been offering, while we are on the search for property to um, create the Lily Houses in its physical form, we have been doing uh, programming, including a lot of the work that Don started several years ago related to Day of the Dead, um, death cafes, end of life uh, program uh, conversations. Um, Don and another person on our board are death doulas. Um, and, and Don was, as I think one of your participants, uh, I think it might've been Chuck or, or uh, mentioned she was very instrumental in Provincetown uh, on the cemetery commission to get green burial um, going in, in Provincetown. So the Lily House is uh, looking forward to serving our community um, as we do in life, also in death. So that is the probably a few more sentences than, than you asked for, but that's the quick picture of the Lily House. Well, thank you for that. And again, uh, I can connect people to you through Don Walsh. And I know the Provincetown Independent had a nice uh, feature article about the Lily House and their work. Uh, yes, in the past couple as did months. the banner. And the banner. Great. Thank you, Anne. How about thank, how about thank you, David. Liz and Julie? Hi, Julie. Um, 
I'm in Falmouth um, and I'm working with Stephanie um, in trying to put together a green burial cemetery. Um, we're in the early stages, but as she mentioned, we have identified a, uh, an existing traditional cemetery that we're hoping to be able to convert into a hybrid. So Great, welcome. We're in the early stages. Welcome, thank you. How about Liz? Hi, David. Um, I'm representing the Rich Family Association, and I have been very, very heavily involved in documenting uh, the various burials, uh, not only in Wellfleet, but in Truro. Um, and I've been trying to expand the library of books that we have for the association. And I have a very, very strong interest in what is happening in Wellfleet. Great, thank you, welcome. And I don't have your contact information, so uh, maybe you can get it from Donna Rickman. I think you know Donna. Oh, absolutely. So we can connect you. Okay. Thank you, welcome. Thank Chuck, you. Chuck, you wanted to say something or add something? Yeah, I actually did. Um, it's a whole other subject, but talk about green burials, but I actually, we delved into the del uh, green cemeteries uh, last summer. We had asked not to be serviced by the um, cemetery maintenance crews because they we'd, we'd had some damage to our stones and we just didn't, we couldn't monitor what was going on up there. So I started having pretty heavy growth in the pathways. Last year, we decided to go become a do-it-yourself cemetery and bought a Club Cadet 42-volt lithium-ion battery all-electric rider mower. has a 30-inch bed. And it, for us, we can, I, I can, so far it's just been me, but I can do all the pathways in and out of the cemetery and all the, um, uh, most all of the graves that are marked with perpetual care with a full charge. We also bought solar panels in order to charge it from, because we have no power at our cemetery. So we can charge the batteries on site. We're no longer dealing with having fuel, oil, or any of those things in our sheds, or we're not doing that, we're not putting fuel, so I don't have to deal with the oil and the fuel and the winter maintenance, and the, the lithium batteries are pretty good, they don't, they, and so I, that, that's what we've done, and we, we take requests as people that do want to be mowed, and we're also going to have a sharp hand mower, so if people want to do their own work, but instead of having to hire the crew, we found that it, our cemetery is not planted or seeded so that we can take down the tick grass so people can walk between one end of the cemetery and the other pretty just on a, on a regular monthly basis. But we don't, have, we don't have to hire a full team of people. We have a small cemetery. It was a, really a burying ground for the South Wellfleet uh, Congregational Church years and years ago. So it's not a big cemetery, but it's just one option to go toward a green cemetery instead of just the burial part. So I don't have to deal with the fuel oils and that things with the mowers, which unfortunately mowing is, it's a lot of what we have to do and keep an eye on. That's all. Great, that was great, great information. And I didn't hear you say you were you were going to loan it out. You have a lending library. We use it in our, in our cemetery. I can get it in the back of my van, but I have to drop the, the uh, steering wheel. But uh, all right, thank it's you, Chuck. <laughs> Any other thoughts, comments, people want to just sort of throw out there? Yes, Debbie. Um, tell me where where uh, Wellfleet is as far as developing um, a green area at uh, uh, Pleasant Hill. Okay. Well, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. Uh, so please, Nancy and Bonnie, jump in. The last place we were is we were, I believe, we were sort of piggybacking on what Provincetown was doing and we were following the work they were doing again in terms of modifying their existing cemetery rules and regulations. And then they had a, a general public meeting to discuss their ideas. And, and again, then they went, I believe they had to go through the select board to get permission. And I don't believe they had to go through town meeting. I believe the select board had the, uh, the the yay or nay on that. And and they were pretty satisfied with what they came up with. And uh, what I did on my own and shared it with, 
with my co-commissioners, and we haven't gotten past this, is I went ahead and edited or added a couple sections to our current rules and regulations, just really cutting and pasting and putting in P-towns, what they had come up with for green burials and modifying it where it wasn't appropriate for Wellfleet. But then they got into the issue of having to change their direction a little bit because of the sandy soils. And uh, so we sort of stopped and we were sort of, rely I'm relying on this meeting to sort of maybe jumpstart us again. But so we're still looking at the possibilities and the options and the obstacles. So that's where we are, but that's my opinion. Bonnie and Nancy, do you wanna say something from your perspective? Uh, David, uh, this is Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Um, Ed had, uh, Ed sent a, a, a chat that uh, he would be happy to talk about the business end of green burials if we were interested. I'd like to hear about that. All right, great. Do you want to add anything else in terms of Debbie's question about where we're at, or you feel like I covered it? Yeah, yeah, you covered it great. We're just we're still in the we're still talking about it. Okay. Uh, yes, Sophia. Yeah, I just want to um, you know let you know we we in Brewster we just went through all that, and we you know happy to answer questions about writing the rules and regulations and. I do know that initially the first thing that Brewster did was have the Department of Health come and, and look at it. I mean, we're approved, it's already approved as a cemetery, but they just, that's what they did. That was a long time ago, about 2006. And then exactly that, took some rules and regulations and then looked at how they would work for us and adapted them. And it was, you know. That'd be great. I will say that uh, as part of sort of the beginning steps, I did get permission from the town administrator to talk to our town council. And she did a pretty thorough search of the literature as in the laws and the statutes for the Commonwealth and for the smaller towns. And uh, I asked her for it in writing and I do have it. And again, I, I'm not gonna say it's applicable to any other town, but she said that of course, it's always better to get public input at every step of the way and to go through the proper channels. But it was her opinion that in the town of Wellfleet, the cemetery commission has the sole prerogative to make and change cemetery policy. So of course we wanna get public input. Of course we wanna apprise the health commission and the health department of what we're right. doing and the select board and everybody, but in fact, the bottom line is we don't need permission from anybody to change our rules to establish a green burial. Right, like I, I, the, the cemetery is already a cemetery, so it's already been approved as a cemetery. So it shouldn't really, in my understanding, make a difference whether it's green or not. Right. So it's been approved as a place to bury people. Yeah. Right, but in fact, in Provincetown, they did need to get permission from the <coughs> okay. So. So you never know. Yeah, Helen, you want to jump on on this? Yeah, I just want to bring something up. So I haven't seen the letter from town council, but I would be very surprised if cemetery commissioners, unlike any other, for example, regulatory board, um, can approve regulations. A policy is something else. A policy is about an approach. Regulations are about how you implement that approach, right? It's different. What, so we did have to goes, hold on, let me finish. Sorry. So any other regulatory board can draft, can approve themselves, but then the state agency <clears throat> that's related to those matters, you can't be out of compliance with the state agency. That's the reason I'm weighing in here, David, because I think that like for every other regulatory board, you can draft it and then finally it has to go to the state agency. My favorite way of doing that, let's say with a shellfish regulation or a planning board related regulation is you talk to the state agency first, then you look at your regulations so that the back and forth doesn't have to happen as often. All right, excellent point, excellent point. 
Any other thoughts, comments? Stephanie, Stephanie had asked um, if most towns have cemetery commissions, noting that Falmouth does not. Well, again, on the outer, on, again, from Brewster to Provincetown, every town does have a cemetery commission. And yet, as I said before, it's interesting because in Orleans, correct me if I'm wrong, but in Orleans and East Ham, those cemeteries are historic cemeteries and they're not active. So there's a second body that's involved with the actual day-to-day -day burial of people. And that's, those are private cemeteries. We were having trouble finding anybody to uh, own up to being in charge of any of the public cemeteries. You know, we uh, own the DPW or the selectmen or the town council. I mean, you know, everybody and nobody in Falmouth is in charge. Interesting. Wow. Well, Sophia made the point when she came to talk to the select board that before the Civil War, they were all green burials. And so therefore the historic quote unquote ancient cemeteries in East Ham, Bridge Road, Cove Burying Ground are already green burials. <laughs> um, but that's really interesting about Falmouth that, I, I mean, that's a large town. How many public cemeteries do you have? I don't know, there, there might be five. And there's nobody in charge? Uh, nobody knows who's in charge. You oh, know, they know, the, they know the DPW is in charge of mowing. But <laughs> other than that. Who's in charge of selling the plots? Uh, well, the, the public cemeteries have not been active in that manner for quite some time. Oh. So, so you have private cemetery that is active? Yes, affiliated with churches mostly. Oh, interesting. Huh. Yeah, although there's one called the Oak Grove, and that's a private cemetery that's not affiliated with a church. But yeah, like they have the old burial ground, and uh, you know they, um, yeah. So the 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 public ones have not had any burials in you know, recent memory. Wow. I just jump in here and say we've been we've been going on for close to two hours now. And, you know, we did have that Lower Cape uh, Cemetery Commissioners meeting last January. Um, but now that we have Zoom, you know, we don't have to ask Falmouth to drive up to Wellpleet or Chatham or wherever. So, you know, can we, can we maybe look at wrapping this up and, and at some point in the near future schedule a, lower, a, a Cape Cemetery Commissioners meeting where we can talk about more of the nitty gritty about the stuff sure not to shut anybody up but that sounds good to me nancy are you proposing that we expand our our sort of outreach to include between falmouth and brewster as well yeah i think that would be great Just whoever okay great i mean now that you know logistics are not an issue you know travel is not an issue absolutely good all right, well, listen, then uh, what I would propose is we'll, we'll end the meeting for today. And if people, I'm gonna, I don't know how to do it. I'm gonna say my, my phone number. And then that way, if you wanna be, if you're new to, to me in terms of communication, I will add you to my, my list of contact people and we'll make sure to include you in, in any future uh, meetings and outreach. So my cell phone number is 410-952-3269. I'll repeat that. 410-952-3269. And I'll also give you my email address. It's r-u-l-e dot a-g-g-e-r-d as in David at gmail.com. And again, I want to thank you all for your, you know, being here and your questions and your comments. And uh, it's pretty exciting to, to have more people involved in this. And uh, it'll be interesting to see where we go. And I think any 
success that any of us has in this big, long continuum of green burials. And I think we need to remind people of that it, is that green burial isn't just one specific way of thinking or doing things, but it's a, it's a whole continuum and there is no right way. There's just a variety of different personal town ways of doing things. And so I think any successes anyone or progress anyone has, I think I'm gonna definitely learn from all of those and see how I can help to apply that in Wellfleet. So thanks again for being here and uh, be safe. Thank you, David. Thank thanks you. for including yeah. us. Thank you, David. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. He is meeting. <laughs>